car does almost have a religious status in the modern world. It's certainly more than just the practical means of transport. People get more passionate about their car than any other machine. At the same time, there's something very cheap and nasty about the things. The way they so quickly rot and fall to bits and end up looking like these ones. It's all such a vast subject that today I'm going to concentrate on the part of the car that people lavish most love and care on, which is also the part that leads to the car's rapid demise. This is the steel skin which gives the car its shape and its rigidity, the body shell. I'm going to look at how it developed and also at its structure. The invention that really created a market for the car by giving people a taste of the fun that could be had from a personal means of transport was the bicycle. <clears throat> It was the popularity of cycling that led to several intrepid engineers trying to go faster by adding one of the new internal combustion engines. Gottlieb Daimler added one to a wooden wheeled bicycle a bit like this. And Carl Benz based his design on a tricycle. <clears throat> Benz was a mechanical engineer born in Germany in 1844. He'd bought a bicycle in the 1860s and had been obsessed by the idea of motorised personal transport ever since. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, Herr Benz, I see you marry my daughter and I give you lots of money. Ah, my engine, my engine, at last I can't build it! Ah. He spent his wife's dowry on a small engineering works and eventually managed to make a simple engine and tricycle. Liebchen! Liebchen! Would you like to come for a drive? Mm, I hope it was worth waiting for, Carl. You and your engine. Oh. 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 He never saw the point of faster speeds and refused to change his basic design. The road changed with the time, so he had no confidence. By 1906, it was hopelessly outdated, and his fellow directors threw him out. Could this be a boardroom coup? Oh, yeah. 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 At exactly the same time, Daimler was also experimenting only 30 miles away, though neither knew of the other's work. Daimler was really only interested in engines. He perfected one that ran at 900 RPM, over three times faster than anything else at the time. He then tried to find all sorts of uses for it. He was never very successful at making complete vehicles, but his engines were adopted by other firms and formed the basis of the first successful cars. This is a 1902 Wolsey. Cars had quickly lost their resemblance to bicycles and started to look literally like horseless carriages. The body, the interior, the wooden frame, the wheels, even the patent leather mudguards and the lamps are exactly like a horse-drawn carriage. In fact, the whole, this part of it would have been made by a traditional carriage builder. Mechanically, though, it's already surprisingly like a modern car, with the steering wheel and the pedals in exactly the same place. It is ready. He has bought one. Why, the fellow has the horse of his own yet, has he? Well, I think we ought to go and see what he has got anyway. Oh, no, certainly. I'm not prejudiced. Come along, Vicar. With a 20 mile an hour speed limit, which stayed in force until 1930, cars still weren't particularly Hello, useful. Hello, then. How are you? Hello, John, old boy. Hello, hey, hey. But motoring quickly became a fashionable hobby for the rich. Hello, Hello, this is part of a film made by Morris in the 1920s about the history of motoring. Yeah. Come on, jump in, sir. Come on, Vicar. <laughs> the 
The idea of mass-producing cars, started by Henry Ford in 1906, slowly spread to Europe after the First World War. This is Morris's factory in 1925. The bodies were still being made with the traditional wooden frames like horseless carriages. Although they were mass-produced, it was all still very labour-intensive. It wasn't long, though, before there was a revolutionary change in the way that cars were made. Well, you like it? Well, it certainly looks very nice. I think it's lovely. It's really all made out of steel, doesn't it? Yes, practically all of it. Today, all cars are built round a steel body shell. It's a good name for it because it is a bit like an eggshell. The material it's made of is very weak. It's the shape that gives it its strength. The steel the car's made of is uh, incredibly thin. It's only just over half a millimetre thick. And uh, I can actually just about cut it with a pair of kitchen scissors. A little bit of a struggle. However, when it's pressed into curved, rounded shapes, curved, rounded shapes like this, this is actually the bit from... Uh, the bottom of one of the doors, its strength increases enormously, is now quite strong enough to stand on. The idea of making cars like this came from an American engineer called Edward Budd, who's one of my heroes. Budd set up his factory determined to make complete pressed steel cars in 1912. His first successful car body for the 1916 Willis Knight looked indistinguishable from a conventional wooden one. Bud started making bodies for almost all the American car manufacturers, and in 1925, he set up a pressing plant at Cowley for Morris. The Morris standard ensures that the OK stamp is placed only on the vest, and that's how they get beautiful, flat sheets of steel. But, Dad, the car hasn't got flat sides. It has beautiful curves. Yes, I know, Miss Inquisitive. I thought you'd want to know how that's done. Well, those beautiful curves you like so much are made on huge machines called presses. Some are as tall as a house and weigh as much as 30 tons or more. The keen, unfashioned beauty of a great machine pressing steel. Five hundred tons presses its irresistible weight on a sheet of steel producing the rear quarter panel of an Austin 7. The rounder the panel, the stronger it is. This modern bonnet is almost completely flat and it's extremely weak. It needs this elaborate piece behind to make it stiff enough. This old Morris Minor bonnet needs hardly any stiffening at all. It is made of slightly thicker metal, but the main reason for its strength is its shape. Deeply rounded curves like this are the obvious way to give press steel strength, and I'm sure this is why such rounded bulbous cars came into fashion in the 30s and 40s. In the truly modern home or the truly modern car, it's functional design that counts. Smart styling is styling with a purpose, as seen in this new 1948 Futuramic Oldsmobile. Futuramic is a brand new word created to describe this brand new post-war General Motors car. Luxuriously appointed inside and out, the Futuramic Oldsmobile brings truly modern post-war design to the automotive field. The rigidity of the steel pressings can be greatly increased by welding them together to make uh, hollow box sections. A bit like that. Uh, this welding is done by machines like this called spot welders. Although it uh, looks rather complicated, all it's doing is uh, squash the two bits of metal between its jaws and pass a large electric current through it. This heats the metal up enough to weld it together. So, um... This 
this now feels completely rigid. If you look at any modern car, you can actually see the little spots. They're all welded together like this. Although at first the welding was done by portable machines like this, today it's usually done by robots. Cars were traditionally built around a strong chassis like this. All the components were fixed on and then a fairly flimsy body could be dropped over the top. However, Edward Budd's techniques changed all this. Bud realised that uh, his all-steel bodies... Whoops! <laughs> Bud realised his all-steel bodies could be made so strong that you really, really didn't need a chassis at all. All the mechanical component, components could be bolted straight on. Yes, I thought the engine, axles and wheels were always fixed on the chassis. On ordinary cars, yes, but this, Morris, is the latest product of engineering science, and the wheels are fixed directly onto the body. The enormous advantage of making a whole pressed steel shell without a separate chassis is that it's highly suited to mass production. Once you have the dies and the presses, the whole process is very quick and cheap. Led by America, the car industry lost its dependence on earlier industrial techniques and became a dominant industry in its own right. Presses like these have been used to mass-produce cars ever since. Although today cars look very different and have improved in countless small ways, they're basically very similar. Almost the only radical change on a par with press steel construction has been the introduction of front-wheel drive. In many ways, the 1934 Citroen Traction Avant was really the first modern car. It was front-wheel drive, it was the very first mass-produced car without a chassis, and it even had independent suspension. Andre Citroen was friends with Bud, and was much more adventurous than any of the American car manufacturers who'd rejected Bud's ideas. Front-wheel drive was slow to catch on. The first popular car to use it in Britain was the Mini, not introduced until 25 years later. Some baby loaded. Remember that family at the bus stop? You know, the ones who just couldn't get away. The new Austin 7s transformed their lives. But what about all that luggage? Can they get it in? With all the mechanical parts at the front, there was much more room inside, which was a big selling point. Mini has its driving wheels at the front. This makes it all very compact, particularly with the engine mounted sideways. The big advantage to the manufacturer was that all the mechanics could be assembled together and fitted under the body shell in one lump. In the last few years, front-wheel drive has suddenly become very popular. It's now actually more common than rear-wheel drive. Today, body shells are designed very scientifically with computers, which has made them lighter and more aerodynamic. It's also made them look more and more alike. This shell could have come from almost any car. Even professional mechanics who've seen it couldn't tell what make and model it was at first sight. Despite all this design, the steel body shell still has considerable limitations. Superficially, the panels dent ridiculously easily, and sorting out even a small dent is quite an elaborate process. 
some outer panels are now made of plastic, which doesn't dent so easily. But this isn't suitable for the car's structure. Another problem with the steel body shell is that even a small dent can distort a large part of it and put vital parts like the suspension mountings out of alignment. Straightening it out is quite an elaborate process. First, the body shell has to be firmly fixed to the particular jig for the model of car, precisely locating all the important points. The damage can then be pulled out. Badly damaged bits still have to be replaced, but he pulls most of the shell back into alignment. For more serious impacts, Bud was originally very proud of the safety of his steel bodies and arranged all sorts of stunts to prove it. Citroen did the same. However, as car speeds have increased over the years, the forces the body shell has to cope with have increased enormously. The force needed to stop a car with the brakes quickly makes them glow red hot. In a crash, the car stops in a fraction of a second, so the force is many times greater, and it all has to be absorbed by crumpling the body shell. Manufacturers try to design areas that collapse, called crumple zones, in any serious impact, leaving the interior as rigid as possible. But safety is only one of the many factors that goes into designing a body shell. Cost, appearance, ease of manufacture, etc., are all equally important. Certainly cars aren't as safe as they have to be when, for instance, you're designing a stunt for a film and safety is the priority. The difference between a real road car accident and a stunt like I'm now going to do is the fact that I know exactly what's going to happen in the stunt. I prepare myself and the car for that eventuality. The body shell is nowhere near strong enough, so we have to reinforce that with a, a roll cage. That's made out of strong tubular steel and I know exactly where the car will be hitting the ground. Most of the impact will happen on that corner, so we reinforce that really strongly above my head. The doors are welded shut. This last door, the one I get in, uh, will be wired shut. To make sure it can't possibly open when it rolls, because the, the door could rip off and go inside the car and do quite a lot of damage. I also put two bars up at the window to make sure that the bonnet, if it did come off, wouldn't come through the window and hit me. I'm not really worried about the glass. The glass is minor. It can't possibly cut me. I'm wearing a visor and gloves. Well, that looks dangerous. I don't even consider it to be even slightly dangerous, but I know what I'm doing.
As I predicted, most of the impact was taken by the corner of the roof over my head, and as you can see, it is possible to build a structure strong enough to take even this drastic punishment. The other big problem with a steel body shell is rust. Despite manufacturers' claims about corrosion protection, about half of all cars are still scrapped by the time they're 10 years old. Most cars are still runners when they reach the yard. It's almost always the body shell, not the mechanics, which seals their fate. This car still looks immaculate, but underneath it's so rusty it's impossible to repair. Bud realised this limitation of his material and spent much of the 30s experimenting with stainless steel. He developed the beautiful stainless steel trains that are still in use in parts of America and Europe. Although the rusting steel used on today's cars leaves a lot to be desired, it does have one final compensation. Cars get more thoroughly recycled than any other machine. There's a whole industry of scrapyards which salvage and resell the mechanical parts and squash up the body shells to be remelted. Scrapyards really deserve a greener image. Perhaps it's almost a relief cars don't last very long. With almost 20 million cars on the road in Britain, and manufacturers in Europe producing over 13 million more every year, three times more cars are being produced than babies are being born. <laughs> They're hardly the symbols of freedom and progress they once were. There's so many of them, they're now often slower than the bicycle they originated from. Cyclists! It's a sad sight seeing what was once somebody's prized possession coming to such an ignominious end. But watching this body shell being squashed does make you realise just how ingenious its design is. The way the whole thing can be made from such a small amount of metal 